Uh, good morning. Uh, as you've just heard, it's going to be a bipolar presentation. So parts of the presentation I'll be speaking to you from the perspective of running uh, a dairy cooperative. And parts of the uh, presentation this morning, I'll be speaking as chair of Dairy UK collectively on behalf of the sector. So which are you? Are you a glass half full? Are you a glass half empty person? Indeed, as a sector or as an industry, are we glass half full people or are we glass half empty? And if we, if we look at uh, the environment we're operating in and we look at just what we're facing, and I'm sure it came out in the presentations yesterday, oversupply, intense price competition, falling markets, lower returns, deflation, and not just in dairy, in uh, uh, the energy sector, in the metals, in commodities uh, in general, and indeed even in the stock market uh, this week. So it would be easy to go to the dark side of the force and to let fear rule our thoughts and drive uh, our strategy and our approach. So instead today I want us to try and dwell on the light side and try and focus on what we can do in a positive way uh, and look at what our response is to the crisis. Um, and in, in some ways we've got a choice. Uh, some people are deciding to wait it out and a natural defense mechanism is to hunker down and wait for the storm to be over. The danger is that things can get worse and you can fall behind. Uh, we've seen protests, we've seen farmers invade supermarkets and blockade <laughs> processing plants uh, in an attempt to try and force a better share or a better price or, or indeed even to promote their plight. Um, we've seen talk uh, or, or requests about legislation using the grocery adjudicator that in some way by legislation we can change the market or what. So I'm going to talk about what we can do uh, and I'm going to talk about upping our game because to be frank if we're looking for government to solve our problems we're going to have a long wait and the best form of help is self-help. So I'm going to talk about how we can change our own destiny how we can focus on getting better, and that's upping not just at processing, right along the supply chain, right back to Semex and the feed industry and those people who, who supply inputs right along the supply chain. How we can be more competitive, how we can take cost out, how we can be more efficient, how we can build a USP, and indeed, and Donald Moore coming along after me might talk more about that, and how we can improve demand, drive demand for our product, and indeed, uh, how we can hunt out more value uh, because there are opportunities out there in the domestic and export markets and above all how we can promote our sector to drive demand so that more people want to buy our products and therefore we'll have more demand and balance the market and the challenge really is economic stability whether you're a farmer whether you're a processor to try and come up with a model that we can sustain ourselves economically as well as environmentally uh, and uh, a key goal for uh, the sector and a key goal for us in Dairy UK is to ensure that we have profitable dairy processors who can pay their farmer suppliers or in my case the farmers who own the business a competitive and sustainable milk price. And the problem we have at the moment is no one's making money. The retailers aren't making money, the processors last year lost nearly 200 million collectively and farmers as we know uh, only too well are also not making a positive margin. And what's happening, I'm not going to go into it in detail, but we're all aware of the dairy cycle and we're all aware of the factors which are driving at the moment the markets down, whether it's a weakness in demand from China, whether it's the European problem where Russia has banned our produce, whether it's the impact of low oil prices and the turmoil in the Middle East. And all of those factors have driven demand down and at the same time we're seeing a surge in milk from favourable weather uh, and from uh, the ending of quotas in the EU. So the problem that we have, in my view in a nutshell, is that global milk supply is growing too fast versus our demand. Now you could say we can cure this problem by making or producing less milk, or we could cure this problem by creating more demand. My guess is it's a bit of both. So if we look at the global um, milk supply, uh, you can see that at the moment it's actually increasing and the level of output has risen as we've gone into the winter 
uh, and we have figures here. There's a mix of figures from October and November, depending on who produces their stats first. But you can see that Republic of Ireland for uh, October were nearly 30%, and indeed the figure for November, the hot figure for November is probably over 40%. Uh, here in the UK, we've seen the UK figure go up, and in Northern Ireland where I am, the November figure was 2.1, the December figure was 3, and the January figure I'm seeing this last week is 4%. So we're, seeing, no, we're, we're not seeing a slowdown, we're still seeing farmers put their foot on the gas pedal, whether it's benign autumn, or whether it's an attempt to drive their costs down by producing more marginal milk. And really the only area where we're seeing any contraction because of the market is in Australasia where New Zealand has, has a modest reduction and Australia also. Uh, uh, interesting enough in the US where internal market prices are higher than they are in Europe, uh, we haven't seen the response even though they have uh, uh, much lower feed costs uh, coming towards them. So it's interesting just to see that the US at the moment is sitting it out. But the reality here, when you look at that figure, and when you look at the collective EU figure now, over 4% growth, uh, and that means that we are producing far more milk than the markets are absorbing. Stocks are building up, and that's having a negative effect on prices, particularly on powder. So if we then look at the supply and demand equation, and I'm sure this has been gone into yesterday, uh, population growth is over 1% per capita consumption growing in emerging markets and probably declining in the West. Overall, around two, the Commission has put out their 10-year forecast, and they're talking about 1.9%. Uh, but we're not currently producing 4% more, and the 4% we're producing more in the EU is equivalent to 1% global output growth. So it's unlikely when we look at demand and when we look at New Zealand uh, and Australia's fallen output, that we're going to see markets balanced this year. And in fact, even if they did, the stockpile of, of powder in particular that we have to eat our way through is going to mean that prices are going to probably now stay very depressed right through into 2017. And really what we've got now, you've talked about the double dip. We're now in a triple dip. And when you look at the figures, and these now are figures that I'm uh, presenting from the spot prices that our business sees in international markets and in Dale Farm, our processing operation, we're exporting to about 40 countries worldwide, mainly the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. And in those countries, and we mark the, the price uh, every day, uh, every hour in terms of spot, you can see that in the last few weeks, we've gone down and we're heading now for the triple dip. And that triple dip has been verified by the, uh, the uh, GDT auction prices and indeed in Europe by the uh, Dutch Dairy Board. And if you want to look at, at the export balance, you can see when you look at China, a significant reduction uh, in powder, uh, skim and whole milk powder and indeed butter. Surprisingly, they're buying more cheese and whey products, so demand there has, has actually increased. And if we look, we're all aware of the Russian uh, export ban or import ban on uh, EU produce. And again, there you can see a significant contraction in trade going into Russia. And this isn't just trade from the EU. This is trade from all countries. So what Russia is now doing is replacing dairy products with analog cheese. And therefore, even if the export ban is lifted, there is a real risk that there will be less demand there than we began. But there's a link not just with uh, the movement in the market, but there's a link uh, if you're a UK farmer, there's a link with currency. And when we look at what's happening, right throughout the last number of months, we've seen sterling gather pace. And that has made the misery in terms of the price we're paying on farm or the returns we're seeing from processing even work worse. Some people think they'll fall back. And we have indeed seen uh, the prices uh, in, uh, or the currency uh, fall the last few days. But if you look at the long-term trend, we're still well below the highs uh, of the pre-recession uh, uh, level. But milk prices don't just follow the market. They follow uh, other factors. And oil and the cost of energy has a significant impact on milk price. And if you look at the correlation between oil price and milk over the last 10 years, you see it's a very, very strong correlation. And what do we have at the moment? We have the lowest oil prices for 12 years, and they're still falling. Uh, if we look at grain, and there's a correlation again between oil and grain and grain and dairy, you see a similar picture. And what do we have now? Falling grain and falling uh, uh, feed prices because of bumper harvests uh, in the last couple of years. 
So where's the product going? When you look at what's coming out of the EU in terms of exports, it hasn't grown by how much extra we've produced in the last year. And the reality is it's going into intervention, or it's going into stocks that are being held, private hands. And I would, I, my prediction will be that in the first quarter, certainly the second quarter of uh, 2016, we will see greater use of intervention. The market is now at or below intervention level. Uh, and with, with, with weak demand, the option for most uh, large dairy processors is to put a portion of the right put into uh, intervention. Now we're in the wake up uh, time of the year and normally markets go to sleep over Christmas and the new year. And in our case, when I talked to our traders yesterday, they still really hadn't seen any sign of life in 2016. So we may well see demand in China lift a little bit. Uh, the EU Commission is talking about trying to resume trade with Russia. And we're, everyone's talking about weather, and maybe a weather fact could come to our help. And when we look at the years where we boomed, like 2013, they generally followed a very poor weather year. So it's been very wet, and there's some drought uh, in Australia, but in reality, the weather at the moment hasn't been bad enough or difficult enough to drive output down. But I think a key issue for us in Europe has been the ending of quotas. And whilst for those countries who for 30 years haven't been able to grow, it's a remarkable liberation. The reality is it's causing turbulence in the market and it's caused a surge of milk, uh, which is adding to our woes. And the reality now is we're not uh, in a situation where Europe is managing the market. And by managing the European market, which was 25% of total global output, they were managing in effect the world market. That is gone, and really now it's the market that's going to set the price and the price that's going to, to govern demand. In a normal market, we would see falling prices drive down output. The market would then uh, see demand increase with lower priced uh, uh, opportunities, and the market would balance. This time around, that's not happening. This time around, the imbalance is accelerating, and demand hasn't responded partially because the oil producing regions themselves are seeing very low income and, and aren't responding to uh, very low pricing opportunities in the dairy market. So in summary, for those people who are talking about uh, why do we have low milk prices and are protesting about playing fair and paying fair or looking for the adjudicator or indeed looking for contracts to in some way to protect them from what's happening, it's oversupply. It's as simple as that. And that oversupply can be caused by our inability to generate demand for our output. But the reality is we're producing more product than our customers want. Or in many cases, we've gone out and produced more product without asking our customers what they did want or having a customer in mind when we produced it. So my contention is that we need a viable business model, a model which is about pursuing sustainable growth, market-led growth, Growth where you have a customer in mind, a product in mind, when you ask your farmers to produce more, and about growing in value rather than just growing in volume. And above all, about getting better, getting better margins, getting better uh, value for money, rather than just getting bigger. Now, if we look at what's coming, uh, as I said earlier, the European 10-year uh, 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 market review was published uh, before Christmas. And they're talking about 1.9% growth, much higher in, in the emerging uh, countries. But their whole 10-year uh, plan assumes a 1% growth at this year in 2016. 1% at the moment is 4.3 uh, in Europe. So we are starting the year miles off uh, what the assumptions are in the EU model. Now maybe uh, lower prices will eventually drive output down, or maybe lower prices will drive demand up. But at the moment, we're looking much, much worse than the trajectory that was painted out for us by the European Union. And if you ask yourself, what does 4% EU output uh, look like? Just to put it in context, 1% of, e, uh, of the world milk supply, 7% growth in the US, 30% growth in New Zealand, and 17% growth in the Chinese milk supply. So the 4% growth in Europe is significant. It's faster, it's more growth than the world has seen 
in any time in the last 10 years, because we talked about New Zealand growing, but when New Zealand was growing, New Zealand wasn't growing at 30%, and when New Zealand was growing, Europe wasn't. And what we've got now is the ability with no quotas to have a response market-wise in terms of output, which is more in terms of a response than we've ever had in 30 years. So we've got to be uh, responsible in that situation and we've got to be much more aware of what we're producing and who we're selling it to. And if we look at the, the, the map of the world where the demand is, uh, demand in the West and in, in the developed countries is largely flat or falling and demand's growing where the population is uh, and where economic growth is. Unfortunately, some of that economic growth as we've picked up in the press in the last months is slowing. So we're seeing slower growth in the BRIC countries and that will have an effect on world demand. And indeed, in 2013, it's reckoned that the amount of world trade in dairy, at, i.e. the bit that's traded, actually fell rather than grew. Now, if we look at what the FAO say, they say long term, over the next 10 years, 15 years, the future is bright, that there's going to be a change in diet, that the emerging economies are going to move from grains towards proteins, uh, animal proteins, and that dairy should do well in that. But look what we're saying here in the British Isles, never mind what they're saying in Europe. If you analyze the strategies of Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, Ireland, and the UK, we've gone crazy. We're talking about growth in the next 10 years of 50%. We're talking about driving our business forward. What we're really doing, if we're not careful, is driving it into the ground. And we've got to look at what we're doing strategy-wise, and we've got to look at what we're about. So I think in the simplest possible terms, it's about baking a bigger cake so that everyone can get more of a slice. And the cake, the icing on the cake isn't milk price, it's margin. And to drive your margin, you've got to get your cost down as well as getting your value up. And there are significant opportunities to get costs down right across the supply chain. And indeed, with falling, falling oil prices and falling feed prices, costs are falling. There are also significant opportunities to move up the value chain and to move to the top of the pyramid towards nutritional and novel products, where not only is the value higher, but the volatility is far less. So as we move away from commodities, then what we're going to see is higher margin uh, and, and much less volatility. Where is all the extra output going in Europe? Largely going into milk powder commodities. It's not going into added value products. It's largely going into milk powders. And that means at the moment we're feeding the bottom base on that triangle rather than trying to get up the triangle as high as we can to the top, uh, uh, the top section. But even if you're in that top section, you're not immune from the market. And, and the commodity price, slowly like a contagion, if it falls, works its way through into even consumer product pricing. And you can see at the moment that that's what's happening. It's gone through uh, the, the commodity sector, it's gone through ingredients and food service, and now we're seeing a huge pressure for price deflation in consumer products. One of the things I'm asked uh, a lot by farmers is, how come if we have 50% of our market in the UK in liquid milk, we're seeing commodity prices pull down our milk price? And I'll, for a few minutes, uh, we don't have much time, I'll just go into that. Uh, the first thing is that uh, demand for liquid milk is not flat. It falls away in the summer when we have actually more milk, and it's at its peak uh, around November, December when we have least milk. So to, to ensure we've got an all year round of supply, we need about 5% more milk than, than our average requirement, our peak requ requirement. If we then look at the weekly shop, uh, the family uh, purchasing of liquid milk is very much a, a Friday, Saturday, maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, with very little uh, purchased on a Sunday. And therefore we get into a situation where uh, we have a significant variation in milk demand through the week. So the average liquid milk processor probably has to carry 15 to 20% more milk than he needs to get through the peak, uh, and then has to shed that milk at the weekend or in certain days of the week. Uh, to make things worse, uh, most people in the UK are moving away from uh, whole milk and are moving into semi-skim, 1% low-fat milks, and those could be as low as 1%. 
uh, or lower uh, skim virtually, z virtually zero, you're getting into a situation then where to get the amount of skim milk that you need, you've got to buy in much more milk than the actual volume that you sell in the shops. And if you look at this slide on the butter element, uh, there's a significant proportion of the milk bought in uh, for, for liquid milk that goes into not just cream, but goes into butter. So immediately you're tied to the butter uh, price. And then secondly, there's a significant shedding of skim milk, which is generally going into skim milk powder. And again, you're immediately now getting 13p at the moment for that milk over Christmas. Over Christmas, on Christmas Eve this year was the worst in my entire career, where at one stage on Christmas Eve, the price of skim milk spot market in the UK went to zero. In fact, at one stage, there were people saying, we will pay you to take skim milk, because if you don't get rid of it, there's about a 7p waste disposal charge under environmental regulations. So why does the liquid milk, uh, why does liquid milk affected by commodities? Because we have to shed a significant amount of skim, because we have to shed a significant amount of cream. The other reason is that if liquid milk's paying 28p to a farmer, and a farmer's getting 18p or 17p from commodities, they will, they will immediately try, if you're smart, to grow your liquid milk business, offer discounts to undercut your competitor, and therefore, the contagion of low prices comes into competition trying to drive. And if it doesn't happen to the retailer, who's quite responsible, it certainly happens in the food sector and the independent sector. So then we've seen the headlines, and this is a headline that I like, utter madness. And I talked about uh, the tragedy in the UK where the consumer wasn't linked in to buying British dairy produce and the fact that if they were, and somehow that would uh, uh, help us all and pay a better milk price. And in fact, it would. And if we look at the experience of Southern Ireland, which is one of the biggest exporters, if not the biggest exporter, percentage terms in Europe, where they're exporting just over 80%, they have, uh, in their National Dairy Council, uh, a campaign with supermarkets to buy only produce that has been farmed in Southern Ireland and processed in Southern Ireland. And in doing so, they've driven out a significant amount of imported liquid milk from Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, and indeed, cheese and butter dairy products coming in from the UK. So our biggest, uh, uh, our biggest import of dairy produce is from Ireland, but they've actually closed, or trying to close their market to British produce. So could we do the same? So how self-sufficient is the UK dairy sector? And it was quite interesting when we tried uh, to work out these figures, they weren't readily available, and it's not an easy calculation to do. So um, production last year was 14.4 billion litres. Uh, this year we're expecting 14.8, heading to 15. Uh, consumption was around 16 billion litres. Imports were around 5.2 billion litres, and exports uh, 3.1. And it's interesting that those exports are coming off really the manufactured part of, of the, the industry and that's about half of, of the output. So in terms of the level of imports and the level of exports, the level of exports actually is much higher in the UK than people imagine. And I'll go into that in a second. So how self-sufficient are we? And we've lost a little bit of the uh, uh, layout of this slide and transmission, but basically you'll see that apart from liquid milk and milk powders and cream, we're not self-sufficient in any other dairy product. We're about 75 self-sufficient in butter, 60% in hard cheese, about 36% in soft cheeses, and about 70% in yogurt. So there are opportunities for us to grow our output, uh, or grow our sales uh, in our home market. And if we look at, uh, gosh, uh, apologies for this, we have certainly lost uh, a few things in transmission. If we look at export performance, what this tells you is roughly by value, uh, we are out outputting about 7.6 million in the UK in dairy output. Uh, and in terms of exports, we're exporting 1.3 billion. So that's 17% of the UK dairy output is being exported in value. And in milk volume terms is 21%. And if you then take that as a percentage of manufacturing, where it's coming from, we are actually, actually exporting 40% of our manufactured output in the UK. So people say the UK is not an exporter, that we're in some high not participating, 
40% of our manufactured output is being exported. And just to give you some statistics, that's up 90% in the last five years, and it's up 28% in terms of sales to the EU in the last five years. 28% inside the EU, 91% outside the EU. So a significant uh, uh, success story. Let's hope, yeah, let's hope the next slide is back to normal. So in Dairy UK, we're going to be announcing and uh, launching in the near future an export strategy. Uh, because it's a success story, it's where there's growth, and there's where there's opportunity, but a, a, an export strategy has to have, uh, uh, what, let me say, a foundation uh, 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 and be built on the reality of a very competitive world market. So we need to do a number of things in the UK to make ourselves more agile, to make ourselves more competitive, and to promote uh, our produce uh, and to break into new markets. Uh, so we're going to publish this strategy shortly, and Judas just put the finishing touches to it. And we're going to be talking about how we can streamline the certification uh, process, how we can target and open up certain key markets, how we can increase the promotion of British dairy abroad and at home. And the reason why we've got to do it at home that the most successful exporters normally have strong domestic markets. So you've got to have that strength around your home market to help you propel into exports. We've got to look at removing trade barriers. Uh, we've got to look at how we can improve our competitiveness. And we've got to look at how we can improve and deliver world-class standards of integrity on farm and in processing. And finally, we've got to look at our innovation and skills so that we are competitive and productive in everything that we do. Let me just take one part, part of the, the, the strategy we're looking at. And we take New Zealand, which is one of the world's most successful dairy exporters. 50% of their output is shipped to countries that have free trade agreements with them. And that means that they're selling into China that for the first part of the year, they're paying a zero tariff, whereas we're paying maybe 15, 18%. And if you contrast that to Europe, only 16% of European dairy exports are sold into countries that we have trade deals with. So there's a significant job to be done by Europe. Uh, and, and indeed, if you believe the people who want to take us out of the European Union, we could do a better job in the UK. I'm not a, 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 a Europhile, but I can tell you I would worry that we do not have the mind attitude, the infrastructure on the ground to, to negotiate the trade deals that we would need to replicate to get the ones Europe has already, and the ones that we would need to replicate what New Zealand has. So if we do have a Brexit, there's going to have to be a huge amount of work done for Britain to create the trade deals that it needs to maintain its current export trade, never mind to grow. Let's get back to import substitution. And if we look at what the opportunities are, this is my estimate, and I've gone to a Deal Farm slide. This is not a Dairy UK slide, purely on the basis that Dairy UK does not have a policy on this, and we're still debating the whole thing around uh, what we can do by way of targets. I estimate when you, t you take out specialist butters and branded butters that are coming in, there's around 50,000 tons of quite generic butter coming into the UK, which we could uh, make for ourselves. There's about 90,000 tons of mainly cheddar and about 100,000 tons of soft cheese and about 100,000 tons of yogurt, all of which could easily be made here. And what we've got to do is not only make it, but we've got to sell it and persuade the customer to buy from us rather than where they're buying at present. And if we did all that, that would create about 1.7 billion litres of demand. But just one thing about that demand. If we want to get that output, or we want to get those sales, we're going to have to be as competitive when we go after them as we do when we go after exports, because we're going to be knocking out international competitors who have low cost of production, who have got high integrity products. In some cases, they have better and good brands than we have. So we're going to have to be competitive to get that import substitution. Whereas there are those who are peddling import substitution as a free ride, as something we can do easily, and that the multiples and the shops and the uh, consumer will fall at our feet and immediately buy our produce. I think there's a big opportunity, but
but I think we're going to have to go at it realistically and improve our competitiveness in our home market, just as we have to if we're going to secure exports. So in the supply-demand seesaw, there's plenty of things acting against us to drive down demand or to, to create more supply than the market wants. But there are lots of things in green on the right that we can do. And if you look at the green on the right, the long-term prospects for dairy are good. The forecasters have got it wrong in one thing, and that is the ability in the short term to produce more marginal milk in Europe and around the world is much better than a number of the forecasters uh, uh, came up with in 2013, where in some way in 2013, forecasters started to say we were hitting the ceiling, we were unable to grow milk production as fast as demand. And what happened? We put the food on the, on the output pedal and we, we blew demand uh, away in our wake. So there is significant spare capacity in the dairy sector and there are significant opportunities to improve productivity. So let's talk about and finish about getting bigger and better. Uh, so not just bigger, but bigger and better. So we need to look at how we can build capability in the UK industry, how we can reduce costs, how we can improve <coughs> compliance. And this is a, a quote coming up uh, from Peter Kendall. And uh, Peter's quote, I think is brilliant, talks about the time is right for us to be more ambitious. And the productivity rate of improvement on farm of 1.4% is woeful. That's Peter's words, not mine, but I would agree wholeheartedly with him. If I then look at what, I, what the colleges are saying we could do, and we take the upper quartile of dairy farmers, we take the median, and we take the bottom quartile, the people who do the benchmarking and the costings and the milk recordings would say the upper quartile are about 3p per litre lower in cost than the median. But the next difference between the median and the lowest quartile is five pence per litre. We have a huge tail of inefficient farms in the UK, which means that there's an opportunity on many farms to improve their, their return by up to five, maybe more P per litre. Five P a litre. So why are we not grabbing? Why are we not running after that price? And here we are in a Semex conference, and I'm not a Semex sales guy, but if we look at what the opportunities are, I would guess there's a sustainable opportunity for 1.5% productivity improvement on farm from genetics alone. And when you take disease resistance and some of the other factors that are now coming in the genomics, the reality is that that 1.5% is probably modest. In fact, Samix, when I talked to him this morning, reckon it could be two, two and a half. So every farmer, if they're getting their breeding program right and they're using genetics, can get an improvement of 1.5%, two, two and a half percent. If we take what happened in Northern Ireland, we grew our milk supply by 50% and the total number of cows stayed the same during the 15 years that we did that. So that shows that there is a significant opportunity to get uh, a, 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 a gain, productivity gain from genetics. There are other opportunities in management, best practice in grassland, best practice in stock management, best practice in managing a business, and best practice in bringing technology into your farm. And those annual improvements, I'm putting at 2.5%. When I talk to the college guys, they reckon if you're in the median or the low quartile, they could be 4 or 5% for maybe 10 years. So we really need to get going, up our game on farm, and get our costs down if we're going to compete against the Irish and New Zealand and those people who are very active in the market at present. So I'm saying there's a sustainable growth target in the UK about 2.5% a year. And I would target 1.8% of that into export, 0.7% of that into domestic market. And the figures might not need to be as big as that, depending on what happens with levers. But we have to be mindful of the bigger picture of what's happening globally. And whilst we're seeing population grow, and whilst we're seeing that growth largely occur in the urban areas, uh, uh, and we're seeing, as I talked about earlier, the diet change more away from cereals towards animal proteins, we are seeing significant demand for water. We're seeing significant uh, problems in the world in terms of distressed areas. We don't know what it's like to be distressed at the moment for water in the UK, and that's fantastic because that's going to be a big strategic advantage. But the reality is there are huge areas of the world that don't have enough water. 
And in terms of oil, there's significant oil out there. And at the moment, we're seeing a glut of it because we're in a false price war uh, between frackers and, and the Middle East. But the reality long term is that there's going to be huge demands on energy. And when we look at all of that together, we've got to get this bit right to ensure 5, 10, 15 years out, we have a model that's sustainable. So improving sustainability is also part of our, our, our strategy. And we've been doing good work in terms of improving energy efficiency, water consumption, reducing it, waste to landfill, redistributing food waste, making sure that our packaging is recyclable. And finally, I'll finish on a lead that will lead hopefully into Donald. And that is, uh, I think it was talked about uh, yesterday, and I'm sorry I wasn't here to hear it, that if we look at demand and we look at by age profile, and we look at those of us uh, who grew up at a time of the milk marketing boards when there was heavy promotion, heavy promotion uh, on milk on TV virtually every night uh, in the 50s and 60s. And we look at it now. On the left, you can see the demand on the emerging generation. On the right, you can see the demand from the exiting generation. Look at the difference. And whilst those emerging generation demand will go up as they maybe hopefully move to tea and coffee like the rest of us, the reality is they're not consuming anywhere near the amount of dairy at this stage of their development as we did when we were that age. And if we don't do something about that, there's a demographic time bomb which is going to take away demand for our products in our home market, never mind in the world market. And that's why when you look at what's happening in the world, you're seeing programs, and indeed I think America's leading the way, to promote dairy. Whereas in the UK, it's a bit lackluster. It's a bit about dairy's okay. You know, it, it can be good for you, but the fat's bad. And you know something? For 30 years, the UK health industry vilified butter. It caused heart attacks. It was bad for you. It made you fat. And what's happened the last three or four years, all the research data coming out has proven that the basis for that original assumption was incorrect scientifically. Butter consumption went up last year by 10%. 10% in the UK, having had years of declining butter because we reversed a lie. And we've got to be careful now that the anti-salt movement and the anti-fat movement, and the zealots in the health industry are still active and are still peddling the lie that dairy isn't good for you. And if we in the dairy industry can't get off our backsides and, and kill that lie and promote our sector, then we are in true trouble. Oh, we look at what's happening in the USA. They're putting their money where their mouth is. They're investing in generic promotion. They're investing in health promotion. They're investing in driving demand for their products. And we've got to do the same. We've got to take the AHDP levy and reinvest some of it in promotion. And we've got to trigger EU support. For every pound we put into promotion outside our home market, we can attract four pound of EU support. We put a million in, we'll get five million of output. So why aren't we doing that? So finally, the other thing that we're going to look at, and we're working with the all-party parliamentary group, is the three-a-day campaign. We've talked about five-a-day. If you go to a primary school right now and you say to a child, what's the best food that you can eat? And you would pull their results. Dairy is way down the list. They talk about fruit. They'll talk about vegetables. They won't talk about dairy because we're not teaching them and we're not training them. And here we have a campaign which will mirror the fruit and veg campaign that we want everyone to eat three portions, particularly young people and old people, three portions a day of dairy produce. And we're going to be driving that campaign in the UK in the coming year. So, finishing. Which are you? Are we a glass half empty or glass half full? Are we working for the dark side? Or are we getting off our backsides and upping our game and driving our industry towards success? We've got to take charge of our, our destiny and we've got to improve our competitiveness, promote more and add value. So the challenge is to build a dairy sector which can make money for processors, for farmers, sustainable year in, year out and not one where we have these peaks and troughs where one year we're celebrating success and the next two years we're worried about failure. Thank you very much.